Um, so Eric and Mansook have a bunch of stuff to present to you today and to also get you organized into groups for the project. But I'm going to begin with 20 or no more than 30 minutes of remarks about arms control. Um, and it's actually a timely topic because given the uh, U.S. withdrawal and now the Russian withdrawal from INF, and nearing the end of the New START treaty, we could soon be in a situation where there's no major arms control agreement governing U.S.-Russian nuclear relations. And that'll be the first time in um, over 45 years that that's the case. Any questions about that? Um, yes. Never mind, that's not a question. I was thinking, well, Trump is making president of Russia. Never mind. We can talk about the whole Trump policy a little later on. He's, uh, some of the somewhat of a bewildering figure in all of this, but quite important. So uh, recall that we had discussed some of this last time. And uh, um, just a bit of background. Nixon was Eisenhower's vice president. And Nixon ran for the White House in 1960 and lost to Senator Kennedy in a very close election, which was actually contested because there might have actually have been fraudulent voting in Illinois, which gave the election to Kennedy. Uh, Nixon uh, accepted the defeat. He went back to California. He comes from Yorma Linda, California. And uh, he ran for governorship. California against Pat Brown, Jerry Brown's father, who just recently the outgoing governor of California, and he lost. That was in 1962. And he gave a famous press conference where he said to the press, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. He was a very bitter person, especially toward the press. He didn't use the term fake news. But he had that sentiment. He was very, he had a view of uh, those who supported him and those who opposed him. Uh, later, he became president. He kept a famous enemies list of people and organizations who he thought were out to get him. And he tried his best to do them on. He moved back to New York and into law practice and then New Jersey. And then, lo and behold, he ran for the Republican nomination again in 1968. 1964 was Goldwater, who was viewed as too extreme. And he lost to Lyndon Johnson, who would replace Kennedy, who was assassinated. Um, but uh, he ran in 68, and he ran against the sitting vice president, Hubert Humphrey, from Minnesota, who was L Lyndon Johnson's vice president. And he narrowly defeated Humphrey. So this it was a huge shock. I mean, here he had lost in 1960. He lost in California. Uh, no one thought he, everyone thought he was finished with public life. And now, only six years after the loss of California, he's president of the United States. Now, he came in with a very virulent anti communist uh, reputation. He had made his, uh, made his reputation uh, in this the Army McCarthy hearings and in, uh, efforts in the Congress to track down communists in the State Department and elsewhere. So people thought there would be quite a difficult time in U.S.-Soviet relations with Nixon as president. But he appointed as his national security advisor Henry Kissinger, who's a very uh, sort of far-thinking, talented, German refugee Harvard professor, and they developed a very close bond, and they each liked each other because each was very secretive. And they basically froze out a lot of the key people, like the Secretary of State and Defense, from the key decisions. Kissinger was the 
principal aide to Nixon and his geopolitical strategy. And together, they developed this plan that uh, one thing they could try to do was to split the Chinese communists from the Soviet communists. They were very close at the time. Then they had had a split in the early 60s. The US was a bitter opponent of both China and the Soviet Union. And they thought maybe if, they could be, if the US could become closer to China, they could play one off against the other. I'm skipping over tons of material. There's vast literature on all of this. It's a fascinating uh, time. Uh, main point is that Nixon, well, in 1971, in the summer of 1971, Kissinger was in Pakistan for a meeting, and they, he, the press was informed that he had a cold and he couldn't be reached for a couple of days. In fact, he went on a secret trip to China to see if he could prepare the way for Nixon's trip to China. This is all done secret, nobody knew about it, and it worked. He didn't meet Mao, but he met Zhou Enlai, the number two Chinese official. Um, uh, that set up the Nixon trip to China in February 1972. I mention this because even though it's not directly related to arms control, Nixon was already very fearful about his run for re-election, which was in 72, he won in 68, the re-election was in 72, and he was looking for a few big blockbusters to really uh, cement support for his re-election. So the first was visiting China, was the first American president to visit China since the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949. This was a huge development, headlines in newspapers like this, it was televised. There was no CNN in 1972, but the networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS televised it for hours and hours at a time. Major photos of Nixon on the Great Wall. This was just beyond belief. Um, and uh, it ultimately led, later on after Nixon, to the normalization of US-China relations, which happened under Carter in 1979. The second feature of uh, Nixon's blockbuster uh, re-election strategy was to reach an arms control agreement with the Soviet Union, which hadn't really been done. I mean, there had been the limited test ban treaty of 1963. There was actually an outer space treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons in outer space. But these were considered areas where no one wanted to put nuclear weapons anyway, so neither side was giving up anything. The SALT agreement, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talk agreement, um, was hard fought and negotiated for three years from 69 to 72. At one point, actually, in 69, there was a border war between the Soviet Union and China. And there were, this later came out in the memoirs. The head of the Soviet delegation to SALT Semyonov uh, called over Gerard Smith, who was the U.S. head of delegation, and told him he wanted to speak to him privately. And uh, he said to Smith, would the United States work with China, work with the Soviet Union, the United States work with the Soviet Union in a joint nuclear attack on China? Smith was flabbergasted didn't know what to say, said nothing. He was a very sophisticated. Smith was a very rich man who was the largest single individual shareholder of General Motors stock at the time. And he never took any, uh, you know, then there was nothing called automatic deposit like we have in the accounts now. So everyone would get a check. Uh, later when he left the government, all his checks were in his drawer. He never cashed any of his checks. For three or four years he was governor. It was all trivial. Money to him. So Smith sent a cable to Kissinger saying Semyonov has just asked if we would collaborate in a nuclear attack on China. What do I say? And Kissinger wrote back, said, said, do not say anything, ignore it, do not respond, assume you didn't hear it. <laughs> 
which of course he did, and then the Soviets interpreted that as meaning it was rejection of the idea, but there was no official rejection. Finally, everything built up, and agreement was reached on these two major elements of the Salt One Agreements. May 1972, Nixon went over there. Again, it was internationally televised all over the world. Huge bonanza. The two parts of SALT, one were an interim five-year agreement to limit offensive arms and the ABM Treaty, which was really the jewel of SALT one. The interim agreement, five years, froze ICBM deployments. These numbers really don't matter anymore, it's just ancient history. Notice that the Soviets had a larger number of ICBMs than the Americans. The Soviets said, look, we have more stuff in the field than you do. We're not going to uh, reach an agreement with you. We're back to equality. We'll freeze it at, at current levels, but that happens to be the case where we have more than you do. So Nixon and Kissinger reluctantly agreed to that. We had 1,054 land-based missiles, and the Soviets had 16, 18. Same thing in the submarine level, the Soviets had 950, 950 launchers on their SL, SSBMs, 950 SLBMs on their SSBMs, the US had 710 on 44 submarines. But the issue just of numerical disparity was a hugely toxic issue in the actual ratification of the treaty. Uh, you may not know, but under American law, a duly authorized representative of the United States, it is sometimes the president, it could be somebody else, has to sign a document. That means the US is a, is a party to the treaty. Uh, it means we've agreed to be part, part of it. But it doesn't enter into force, EIF, enter into force, unless it's ratified. And it's ratified, it's approved, by the U.S. Senate, uh, which requires two-thirds of sitting senators have to vote to ratify the treaty. So there was a big, uh, uh, a big debate about it. Treaties are, uh, you know, the Congress is divided into many committees. Uh, the committee that examines treaties is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Only the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, not the House Foreign Affairs Committee, just the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And a key figure on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and also on the Senate Armed Services Committee, which dealt with arms control, was Henry Scoop Jackson. Any of you heard of Scoop Jackson? Scoop Jackson was a very prominent national political figure of the Democratic Party. He was a conservative Democrat, came from Washington State. He ran for president in 1976, uh, passed away. Uh, he was particularly upset about the numerical disparity in the interim agreement and, uh, and wrote a, a, an amendment which was passed by the Senate, although it had no, no uh, impact on the ratification, that in the future all treaties with the Soviet Union had to have at least numerical equality. It could never again be a treaty where the U.S. was numerically inferior even if it meant nothing, even if it had no military meaning. We're not going to accede to any numerical inferiority with the Soviet Union. Um, the treaty was overwhelmingly ratified and entered into force. The second, uh, second part of the treaty of the SALT I agreements besides the five-year interim offensive arms agreement. Notice it just capped the deployments. Didn't do anything about, about uh, getting rid of them. It wasn't disarmament, it was arms control. It was capping the numbers. And at least let's agree to stop here. The other piece of the uh, agreement was the ABM Treaty, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. That goes back to what I told you back with the with the Glassboro, the Glassboro summit of New Jersey, where McNamara explained the destabilizing effects of defenses. Both sides had missile defenses. Okay. 
and uh, both, both sides had missile defenses, and they agreed that each side would just have two ABM sites, each with 100 interceptors. An ABM system has interceptors and it has radars. The radars pick up the attacking missile and send signals to the interceptor to launch to intercept the attacking missile. Uh, 100 ABM interceptors were to be around Washington and 100 around Moscow and another 100 were to be around one U.S. ICBM field in the upper Midwest and uh, the Russians would have 100 interceptors in ICBM field around in Siberia. This was a treaty, not an interim agreement. And a treaty, it needs ratification from, from the Senate. But the, unlike the other agreement, which was five years, limited duration, this was permanent. A permanent limitation on ABM deployments. And it stayed that way and lived throughout uh, the rest of the Cold War and beyond until President George W. Bush was president in 2000. And he had on his staff a number of people, including actually John Bolton, who's now National Security Advisor to Trump, who were deeply suspicious and adversarial toward arms control. Uh, Richard Pearl, who was Scoop Jackson's assistant, had once said, arms control is worthless. If you have friends like Britain, you don't need arms control. And if you have enemies like the Soviets who'll cheat, it's of no value. And it just is, uh, it's duplicitous and it's misleading. So there were many people, I can't, I wish I could capture for you in a little bottle, the antipathy between people who oppose arms control and the people who supported it. I was the first getting involved in this business in the 70s. I was with the research group at Harvard that was pro arms control. And I had firsthand combat experience with the enemies of arms control. And it was really brutal. It was, it was personal. It was bitter. It was, I once got into an argument with Paul Nitzer, this world famous defense analyst who was 40 years older than I was at the time. In a meeting in Aspen, Colorado, we disagreed on a key point on missiles. And he said to me, not, he said, if I'm wrong, we just spend more money. If you're wrong, we lose the country. And uh, I actually didn't speak to him for about 20 years. I let it spoke to him when I went to the government and actually asked him for some advice. He was relatively pleasant to me. But uh, unlike a lot of other policy issues where people can disagree and then go out for a beer, this was a bitter, deeply personal uh, confrontation among the two groups. And it lasted throughout the Cold War. Um, when uh, Bush came in, they were concerned about North Korean and Iranian missiles that could attack targets in Europe under, for the Iranians, and in, they could attack Japan and South Korea in uh, the North Korean case. And uh, Bush also wanted to have some minimal defense for the continental United States against Russian attack. So, uh, in June 2002, that's, uh, what, 30 years, 30 years after the treaty was signed, the U.S. formally withdrew from the treaty. Now, it's often said, incorrectly, the U.S. abrogated the treaty, the U.S. violated the treaty. It's not correct. In every treaty, there's a withdrawal clause. 
you and I agree on something, if we want to get out of it, we have to do, go through the following steps to get out of it. And Bush just followed the withdrawal clause, which involves, I think, a six-month notification that you're going to get out of the treaty, and then you can start uh, doing things that would normally be violated by the treaty. So this was a big deal that the U.S. would be the first to withdraw from the ABM Treaty, which it has withdrawn till this day. Um, even Obama, I was in the Obama administration, and there was a flotation in the Obama administration of trying to get Senate approval to rejoin the ABM Treaty. And there was just no way we had the votes in the Senate to do it. There were just too many senators who felt that you can't trust the Russians, they cheat. We don't want the agreements anymore. Um, we also put uh, limited missile defenses in Alaska at the abandoned Berg Air Force Base as some missile defenses, defend against some limited attacks against the continent of the United States. Missile defenses have limited ability against a sophisticated attack against MERV, multiple independent targetable retro vehicle warheads. Uh, missile defenses can be overwhelmed by numbers of, of attacking warheads. They can be defeated by jamming the radars, by eluding them with so-called chaff, which are metal strips that are released by the RV in its trajectory. And the radar thinks it's a reentry vehicle, but it isn't. It's, it's a decoy. So there are various ways that ABM systems can be defeated. Um, on the, against a more primitive attack, like the North Korean attack or an Iranian attack, maybe it would be successful. Anyway, this in, in some ways was the halcyon days of arms control. The first US-Soviet nuclear arms control agreements to limit strategic nuclear arms. Now, remember just one thing about the arms worth mentioning. The weapons come in sort of different flavors. Those that are on launch vehicles that can fly over 5,000 miles, they're strategic. You could have arms on shorter range missiles that are tactical or theater weapons. You could have missiles that, so strategic are those that are only on the bombers, ICBMs, and SLBMs that can fly these distances. Not only strategic, but they, could, they have to be deployed, they have to be put on the missiles. We have a lot of missile, we have a lot of weapons that are not deployed. They're in warehouses. So the Soviets have many of them. We don't even know how many they have. They probably have many more than we have. So the limit is only on deployed strategic nuclear weapons. It's not on undeployed weapons, it's not on tactical weapons, it's not on theater weapons, it's just on these weapons. Any questions or comments on salt one? Yes. So from the perspective of that point, wouldn't you just make systems that can be easily set up for deployable defense? So that you could legally say by the treaty that I don't have to deploy it, but they have the capability of being you know, deployable within like let's say an hour? Well, there are efforts to have systems ready for rapid deployment, not necessarily within one hour. Um, but yes, I mean yes, having a stockpile of undeployed nuclear weapons. It's a reserve force against the confines of the treaty. You know, I have to understand too, uh, we are each using that so-called national technical means of verification. That's uh, aircraft reconnaissance and satellite reconnaissance, and also human intelligence and electronic intelligence. So each side has ways to try to check up on the other. And you know, <coughs> decide whether it's worth the risk, possibly to be accused of storing weapons, even though they're not against the treaty, that look like they could be used. You know, it might blow up the whole architecture because the architecture is for a lot of other things besides the weapons. Yes. Could you explain the logic behind building missile defense systems to defend against the limited Russian attack? I, I'm just curious. Yeah. Why? Well, it was, you know, I think it was largely by the Bush administration a political move 
to say we're done with our control of Egypt. It was an anti-Soviet uh, measure, as opposed to a technical solution to thwart a real Soviet attack. Okay, on next. Uh, now, Kissinger in the mid 70s, well, Nixon, of course, was forced out because of the Watergate scandal, which I know only some of you know about, but take it from me, it was a real scandal. And uh, he was forced to resign. And Ford, his vice president, became president. And Kissinger remained. He not only was the national security advisor, he was secretary of state. He then had to give up the national security position. Scowcroft, famous Air Force general, became national security advisor. Kissinger was Secretary of State. At one point around 1975, Kissinger and a colleague of his, Sonnenfeld, wrote an article which had this famous quote, arms control is not about arms control. So later, Kissinger was asked to flesh out what that meant. And what he basically said was, he felt that in a world of large numbers of nuclear weapons on both sides, it actually was a pretty stable situation because neither side would risk an attack for fear of being annihilated in a retaliatory attack. That the Soviet Union had a small group of people, the Politburo, nine men, who made all the key decisions for the Soviet Union. And they were unreachable. They, you couldn't get to them. It was uh, Brezhnev at this time. Um, it had been Khrushchev and so forth. So he said, and we had no, we had no detailed relations with the Soviet Union. We didn't trade with them. There were no scientific exchanges to speak of. There were no educational exchanges. They were largely cut off from the world. They only worked with their East European allies and their North Korean allies, their Vietnamese communist allies, Cuba. That was about it. So Kissinger argued that one way to break down the wall separating the Soviet Union and to influence their decision making was to have an agreement that would change the atmospherics in the world, that U.S. Soviet relations were good, they were getting on a better level, and that this ultimately might trigger different views within the Soviet Union, who would say, we can do more good things with America, and so it would split the kind of uh, unified anti-American view of the Soviet leadership. So it had a very valuable political and psychological and ultimately economic effect. And said, so that's what arms control is really about. It's not about counting the borders. Others completely disagreed. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, that was good. And the term that he used to improve U.S. Soviet relations was detente and uh, French word to get along. And uh, Ford had a big decision to make in the 1976 presidential campaign, whether to endorse Kissinger's detente policy or not. But at that time, uh, I think I, I had mentioned to you, maybe I didn't, it was the other press, Schlesinger, the Secretary of Defense, who was very opposed to Kissinger's detente policy. He got fired over various things, and he was replaced by Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld, who some of you may know about from the from the invasion of Iraq by uh, uh, by George uh, W. Bush in 2003. Rumsfeld was also deeply opposed to the detente policy. Rumsfeld was a very shrewd bureaucratic player, and he convinced Ford not to endorse detente in his re-election campaign against Jimmy Carter. And uh, ultimately, Ford lost the election. And later, Ford said that he thought that was his big mistake. There were a lot of hawks opposed to it. There were more people who supported a better relationship with the Soviet Union. And if Ford had endorsed detente, Ford thought he would have been reelected. Um, so uh, Ford lost, and Jimmy Carter became the president, the peanut farmer from Georgia who was a nuclear engineer at the Navy Academy in 
a Naval Academy grad, but uh, who didn't know much about other things. I'm going to have to skip over a bunch of stuff here in the next couple of minutes. So they started down the road again, Carter, and his national security advisor was named Zbigniew Przezinski. We actually, I was a student of his at Columbia. The very smart, very hawkish, anti-Soviet Polish refugee who became national security advisor to Carter. He just died uh, a couple of years, about a year ago. And uh, they produced in consultation and negotiation with the Soviets the SAW II agreements, Roman numeral II, in June 79, which established numerical equality of nuclear weapons delivery systems. Should be a period there. So that was consistent with the Jackson Amendment. There was equality. And limited the number of deployed MERV missiles. But before the ratification process could get completed, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in December 1979. And once they did that, the support for Seoul II collapsed in the Senate. So Carter had to withdraw the treaty from the ratification process. So Seoul II, the follow-up to Seoul I, was never ratified. It never entered into force. It never became operational. Move on. The you know, INF Treaty was the next one that came under Reagan, and I'm going to discuss that. That's what you guys are going to deal with. And these were intermediate range of weapons in Europe. Uh, Reagan, though, started a process called START. Instead of strategic arms limitation talks, capping them, he said, what about strategic arms reduction talks, reducing them? And it didn't happen while he was in his tenure. Reagan was president from 1981 to 1989. Well, he was replaced by George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush's father. And under George H.W. Bush, the START I and START II treaties were signed. And they were uh, ratified by the U.S. Senate. START I limited the number of warheads. To 6,000, you see the result of a big, huge drop off in deployed weapons. Remember, this is 91. This is the year that the Soviet Union collapsed. This is the year that Gorbachev is, uh, you know, moving down the road toward the dissolution of his own country. Um, and in 93, the Soviet Union didn't exist. So, Star 2 was actually a US Russia treaty, not a US Soviet treaty. It banned Merv ICD. But later on, as you see, Russia withdrew from it because the U.S. had withdrawn from the ABM Treaty. So that's start one and start two. Finally, next, when Obama became president, when I was in the Defense Department, we began to work on a successor to the new to start one and start two, and that was called New Start. That was handled by the State Department. And I was a Department of Defense representative to the U.S. delegation that was uh, being headed by the State Department. And that was signed in April 2010 and expires, you know, uh, two years from now. So it limited the deployment of strategic nuclear warheads to 1550. It's a huge reduction. Just so you know, at the height of the Cold War, and the height of the Cold War by nuclear terms is measured in 1967, the U.S. and the Soviet Union combined had deployed, I believe, 67,000, had deployed 67,000 nuclear weapons. Total or each? Total. Um, this treaty limits each side to 1550. To 87% reduction. Um, and it has these other limits as well. It allows for different kinds of uh, monitoring, including on site inspection. The Soviets always resisted on site inspection. On site inspection is I can go up to you and say, open that door. I want to see what's in that door. 
the Soviets, you know, might have been hiding things, so they weren't too keen on on-site inspection. They agreed to on-site inspection in the street. And this was the time, this was the small interlude when when Putin was not uh, present and Medvedev was present. That's Medvedev on the right. Good-looking young man and Obama and smiling. The relations between Obama and Medvedev were very good. The relations between Obama and Putin were very bad. So this is the treaty that's left hanging in the balance now. It has two years to run. And uh, should it expire, or should the US or Soviet Union withdraw from the treaty before February 2021, then that would mark the end of 40 years of nuclear arms control between the US and, and Russia. This might not seem of any consequence to you, but I can tell you this is a big deal because it will trigger additional weapons developments by both sides, which can have behavioral effects in crisis situations. It could be a very dangerous situation. So that's uh, my mini arms control review for you. Any questions or comments? Okay. I, what I, one, one last thing I just quickly mentioned in the book, there's a lot of discussion of some of the main personalities, Brody, Herman Kahn, Bill Kaufman, Wolfstetter. A lot of their uh, disputes, some of them were about the delicacy of the nuclear balance. We read about that with Wolfstetter and uh, Brody in particular. But also part of it was, what is the value of US nuclear weapons in Europe as a deterrent to a Soviet attack in Europe. Because the Soviets had a <coughs> numerical advantage in conventional forces in Europe. They had huge tank armies that could easily roll into Western Europe. And at one point, McNamara was going to be Secretary of Defense, ordered the deployment of 8,000 US tactical nuclear weapons in Europe to deter a Soviet attack. Some said, you know, you put them there, they're more likely to be used. We don't want to a war. So there's disputes in Europe about it. It involves the management of the alliance, which is a complicated deal among so many member states. That's another feature of the whole uh, nuclear policy dispute between uh, the US and the Soviet Union. I just wanted to get that in. Okay, I think that I overstayed my welcome. Thank you, and I will turn it over to Eric. And so on. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to start uh, with um, first working on breaking up into groups. Mansuk and I wanted uh, to start on moving you all into groups for the final project. I know it sounds a little early, but it'll come up um, pretty quickly. Uh, Mansuk had uh, proposed four groups, um, two on the implications of the uh, withdrawal from the INF and two groups on strategies for attaining uh, the INF. Um, I had been thinking for the groups that um, work on strategies for retaining the INF, one group, and, and feel free to chime in, um, would work on strategies for retaining the INF as it is, and one would work on uh, strategies for modifying the INF so that it would be retained by both parties. Um, did you have any idea of how further you wanted the INF withdrawal groups to be broken down? Uh, I'd put this group. Yeah, okay. And I'm modifying. Okay. Um, so let's write these, these up here. So that we don't have any. And there'll be some flexibility here. We're going to try to make groups evenly distributed. So um, we have implications. Uh, of INF withdrawal. Um, we have one for retaining INF as is, and one for a modified. Were there any other groups that you want to be 
Okay. And were you wanting two? Yeah, two for implications and a one for okay. Kenny and a one for Wing Five. Yeah. So we'll we'll split up the implications group later, but um, I wanted to go through and get everyone's interest in each of these groups, and then I'll send around a list of um, a list of groups, and you all can start contacting each other and organizing. So. First, who is um, interested in implicate, working in the implications of the INF withdrawal? Um, so let's see, I'm going to try to go through and sit, uh, write your names down one by one. Um, please correct me. So Tyler Bailey, Yasmin? Nina. Nina. Um, did you enroll recently? No. No? OK. Um, Austin Mullen. Fiona Bach. There are 18 students here, two of us. Um, let's start with the one that you're most interested in, um, and then we will reshuffle people as necessary. Uh, so D, Annie, uh, Sarah, um, Lance. Uh, Jake uh, and Shelby. Chelsea. Chelsea. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, for retainer of the INF as is, who's interested in that? No. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's possible. I mean, sometimes countries change their positions. Initially, uh, in the SOLT 1 agreements, in those early negotiations, the Soviets opposed an ABM treaty and supported an interim agreement on offensive arms. The U.S. opposed the interim agreement but supported the ABM treaty. Ultimately, they came to agreement. So it's not, they're not too frozen forever. It's a creative project. Um, I, I have a similar question. What, what are we trying, are we trying to win, like, uh, like, are we trying to represent the United States here and win, like, some sort of proposed theoretical war game in which we gain an advantage over some number of enemy states, or are we trying to balance out the world here? I don't care. I'll do either. I just see that. Um, I think the goal, so the, the goal here, so that we're going to have a crisis simulation later in the semester that more so uh, goes along the lines of that. This is more to get practice with drafting a policy document that would be presented to um, leaders of the State Department, Defense Department that would guide them. I don't know, Michael, what do you think? No, I mean, I, I think it should just be you know, people who would be reasonably interested in what you have to say. Um, and I think also to address the question about group two, the INF as is, I think the, the lines we were maybe thinking along is the INF with its current um, party, so the US and Russia, uh, and then a modified INF would bring in China. Uh, so that's more along the lines of what we're thinking. So if that changes anyone's mind, let me. Um, and we may have to do some reshuffling. Mansuk and I will discuss what we think the workload um, for each group will be and how many people would need to be in each group. Um, but we're just gauging some general interest now. All right, and then finally for a modified INF. Um, okay. So we are missing two people here. We're missing two people? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. One. One. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, 
so, so did you want to discuss this? Or is this, uh, or are you saving this for discussion? I think um, otherwise I'll, I'll start on Charles. But if you yeah. want to go ahead. Or, Excuse me, how many of you have seen this project, this presentation? No? You, you've seen that? Last week? Infection. Yeah, infection. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can see that there's some uh, explanation through uh, Dropbox. Yeah. It is posted in uh, our B courses. Right. Yeah. Um, if, if you aren't getting these announcements, B courses send announcements. So I announced this, and it's a, a recording of our discussion with um, Mansuk presenting this. It does a very good job of summarizing the INF treaty. So if you're not getting those announcements, please go into B courses and change your settings accordingly. Um, it's going to be the way that we communicate with the class. Uh, is there anything else? You want to yeah. Okay, that's it. Okay. So we'll now move on oh, sorry. Uh, to do our fission lecture or finish up our fission discussion. Um, I think I'm going to stay over here. Okay. Sure. It'll be a mixture of technical and policy questions. Like, is it like we the policy right? questions, I can on the policy side, there'll be some short answer questions based on the readings and the lectures. None of them will be, you know, what did Kaplan say on page 53, line six? <laughs> None of them will be true. They'll all be central and important issues, concepts, personalities, weapon systems, ideas that I've discussed in the lecture and emphasized or that are in the readings. And then there might be a couple of short essay questions comparing and contrasting different points of view or whatever, something like that. Um, all right, so I'm going to begin on um, the remainder of Carl's vision material. So as we discussed in the last lecture, um, we have a cross section um, that describes the probability or the aerial probability that some particle that's sent into a matrix of material is going to interact with some uh, other particle of interest. And so we have this illustrative uh, map of what, you know, throwing in particles into a plane of nuclei would look like. And some of the particles will pass through and some of them will interact or scatter. So <clears throat> doing that, we can, uh, once we know this cross section, we can develop a concept of mean free path. And so the mean free path is uh, the path at which the part a particle that is incident on this matrix can travel before it has a 69.3% uh, a chance of uh, being interacted uh, with the matrix. So as if you had uh, some ideal material that was purely absorbing, as you pass through, uh, you lose 50% of your um, beam every, some, uh, every set distance. So just like half-life, you have some exponential attenuation of your beam. Now that won't necessarily happen realistically because you can have scattering interactions where the particle uh, scatters, but then is able to continue uh, through and, and pass through the target. And you can calculate your mean free path by multiplying the number density of your target by the cross section of the target material. Um, so as uh, Carl, dis as we discussed in the last le lecture, we have two uh, fissile isotopes that are most readily available for making a nuclear weapon, uh, uranium-235 and uranium-238. Okay. Are we frozen? 
so we can place these facile isotopes in a material matrix in order to facilitate a chain reaction. So for the concept of a reactor, what we ideally want is a fission followed by a fission followed by a fission. We don't want one fission, then two fissions, then three fissions, because you're going to have a runaway reaction uh, like you might have in a weapon. Uh, so in order to do this, we need to slow down the neutrons that we get from fission and allow them to continue forward to cause another fission. Uh, the reason this is, is you, if you remember the cross-section diagrams that we presented in the last lecture, the cross-section for thermal neutrons, neutrons that have been slowed down, is much higher than for those that are fast. So you can look at this fuel rod concept where you have a rod of your fissile material and you start with a fission that releases a neutron. And you want this neutron to go on and create another fission. So in order to enhance the probability of that happening, you have to have some moderator material to slow down that neutron. And so an example of this is water uh, because it contains a lot of hydrogen and the neutrons are able to lose a lot of energy by scattering through that hydrogen. So that neutron scatters through the water and slows down and reaches another fuel rod where it uh, encounters another uranium atom, causes another fission. Those neutrons are released and are slowed down and cause more fissions. Uh, but that wouldn't necessarily work on its own because if you did that and you slow down all of your neutrons and they all go on to create more fissions because you have an, on average uh, 2.5 neutrons released per fission, you would have a runaway chain reaction. So you have to have some sort of control mechanism over this reaction. So the way this is done in reactors is with control rods. Uh, control rods contain highly absorbing material like boron, cadmium, or gadolinium, uh, where you can bring this control rod into your material matrix, and some of the neutrons will have to pass through that control rod, will get absorbed, and this will limit the chain reaction. And the way you use a control rod is you move it through the, uh, the matrix until you find a point where you've reached a perfect level of criticality. Uh, that is, you have, for one fission, the neutrons go on from that fission and produce one other fission. No more and no less. Uh, so that criticality is referred to as um, we, we use the, the letter K to uh, describe this. So when you have K equals to one, that is a critical system. And K is defined as the number of neutrons present in one generation divided by the number of neutrons present in the last generation. So you don't want your neutron population within the reactor to be growing or shrinking, otherwise down the reactor if it's shrinking or you're blowing up the reactor if it's growing. Uh, subcritical is when you have K of less than one, uh, K greater than one is supercritical. And when you have a large K, uh, several percent larger than one, then you have a bomb, something that will very quickly um, detonate. And we can discuss the differential equations related to this um, if we have time later in this reaction. I don't know. Um, so, one uh, way that we can think about this is the four-factor formula. So if you have an infinite system, this is a material matrix that goes on in three dimensions forever, then you can uh, describe the K infinity. So this is your infinite uh, multiplication factor. And it's the product of four probabilities. Uh, eta is the number of neutrons emitted per neutron captured in the fuel. So this would be uh, per neutron captured, so you have 2.5 neutrons produced per fission, um, and you divide that by the number of neutrons captured in the fuel. Not every neutron captured in the fuel is going to create a fission, though, so you can't just use nu, which is the average neutron multiplicity from fission. Uh, then we have epsilon, and this is the fraction of fast neutrons that induce fission. So there's uh, a cross-section for thermal fission and a cross-section for fast fission. There's some non-trivial probability that as you're slowing down your neutron that is just produced from fission, it might capture in the 
fuel and cause fission. So this captures that probability. Um, then there is P, which is the fraction of neutrons surviving the resonance region. So uh, this is the probability that your neutron, as it slows down even further, is able to survive uh, the resonance region of whichever uh, materials matrix you have. So that's going to be the sum of all the cross sections uh, that are in that material. So you might have boron, water, um, uranium, other structural materials such as iron. This is the probability that a neutron is able to slow down without being captured in that region. And then finally we have F, which is the captured by the fuel. So this is the probability that a neutron that has made it to the thermal region captures within the fuel and not within other material within the medium, such as your water, your structural material, your control rod, uh, etc. And so I guess we can um, relate this to our uh, cross-section plot. So fast uh, neutrons are produced up here. You have some probability that a fast neutron uh, will cause fission. You have some uh, probability whether the neutron will be able to slow down and make it through this resonance region where you have these, again, these large spikes in the cross section that make it very hard for a slowing down neutron to make it past. And then if it does make it past this region, the probability that it will cause, uh, that it will be captured in the fuel. Uh, so for example, here is the cross section of iron. Iron is a common structural material in nuclear reactors. So you have a very large resonance region with relatively large cross sections in the resonance region reaching up to 100 barns per resonance. So there is a large probability that as you're slowing down your neutrons, it will meet the uh, iron that you have within the reactor and uh, capture on the iron. The iron cannot fission, and so you don't get any gain in your neutron population from capturing on iron. In fact, you lose um, from your neutron pop population by capturing on iron. So this is when you have an infinite extent. You would have a fission, the neutron goes on, and at some point it's going to have to interact somewhere. It can't leak out of your system and go on to a region where you don't care about anymore, where it's not going to be useful to us anymore. I'm just gonna skip that. Okay, so now we can look at a more realistic system um, where you don't have an infinite extent, so you have a finite extent. And so now you add two probabilities. One is the probability that a fast neutron uh, does not escape the assembly. So you don't want to lose your fast neutrons before they thermalize because then you're just going to lose your neutron economy. So there is a probability that you keep that fast neutron in the system without it escaping. Then there's a probability that your slow neutron does not escape the assembly. So once you've thermalized your neutron, this is is the probability that the neutron does not leak because you may have slowed down the neutron, but it could still leak out of your system, leak out of the walls of your reactor and no longer be useful to you. Uh, so total mass is important to this problem. Um, if you have a small piece of uranium, the probability that your neutrons are going to leave that uranium without causing further fission is rather high. If you have a larger mass than uh, you have an increased probability that you'll be able to cause more fissions with those neutrons. Uh, but mass alone is not important, it's also density. So as uh, we remember from the rate equations with cross section, it's dependent on the number density you have. So as you increase your density, you have a higher probability that your target particle is going to interact with your target nuclei or your, your uh, projectile particle is going to interact with your target nuclei somewhere as it's traveling. As you decrease density, you decrease that probability. So for example, if you had a, uh, a thin film, you're increasing the probability that your neutrons leave the film, film without being able um, to interact and cause more fissions. And so this brings up the issue of geometry. It's mass, geometry, and shape. You need to have a shape where your neutrons are continually able to be captured and cause more fissions. 
Uh, but there are other things such as you could add a reflector material. So there are some materials that uh, perform neutron scattering very well and increase the probability that if your neutron leaves your medium of interest that it could undergo a scattering reaction and then come back into uh, your region of interest. And so you also have uh, a factor of neutron reflection affecting your reactivity. And there are a number of other factors that you can, um, that affect this. And it really takes a large amount of detail to calculate your K effective uh, to any great uh, level of detail. And all of this is dependent on the cross sections of these various materials, uh, particularly your fission cross section. So that's all Carl had within these lectures. Um, I guess I can show you briefly the differential equations that affect your neutron population as a function of your criticality. So if you want to describe the population N of your neutrons within your reactor, it's equal to your multiplication factor times N. So this is the number of uh, neutrons you have in a subsequent generation minus the number of neutrons you have in the current ge generation divided by tau, where tau is the mean generation lifetime. So that rep represents some probability that, um, or that represents the uh, average lifetime of your neutrons as they move around within your medium before they go on to interact again. And so if you solve this differential equation for um, initial condition where you have no initial uh, neutron population, mm -hmm. you get a time dependent equation for your neutron population that looks like this. And so you can see here, if you have K equals to one, you have K one minus one, this becomes zero and you have a steady state uh, of your uh, neutron population. If you increase K beyond one, uh, then your, the argument of your exponent becomes larger than zero and you have a total growth rate as a function of time. And if you have K less than one, then you have a dampening exponential and you're losing neutron population as a function of time. Uh, and I think I'll just stop that there. We have some additional time. And you want to, yeah. So we have a few minutes. So. <laughs> this is my first time, second time. Seven years ago. <laughs> so uh, we have 50 minutes. So let's briefly discuss the, the INF treaty. This is important because uh, there is some history and a background uh, in a US withdrawal and uh, Russia's uh, blaming against the US. So we need to understand some, uh, some background knowledge and uh, the history to develop your ideas and uh, to argue your stance. So it was uh, around 1960 and 1970. This is an uh, uh, intermediate range ballistic missile, whose name is a uh, SS-20 Sabre. During the uh, 1960s, the United States deployed it's a short range of the last missile, which is named Pershing 1 and Pershing 1A in Western Germany here. It had a range of around 1,000 kilometers and less than 1,000 kilometers, around 100 kilometers. And uh, those missiles were deployed because of Soviet massive uh, ground forces, such as 10,000 tanks, which is named uh, Operational memory group. So to counterbalance, counterbalance Soviet massive ground forces, the United States and uh, NATO forces deployed some kind of uh, missiles, and the Soviet countermeasure was uh, developing its own kind of uh, intermediate 
range, the last missile, it had the range of around 30,000, 3,000 3, miles. So the red round is the range of the uh, SS-20 Sabre. So the problem is this missile will cover the entire European continent and we will reach to some area of Canada. So there is a problem, problem of proportionality. That means will the U.S. counterattack with ICBMs if Soviet attacks European countries with SS-20? Answer was uh, no by countries such as France. So there were uh, some kind of meetings among NATO, so foreign ministries and defense ministries. And in December 12th, 19, 1979, NATO decided the kind of a double track decision. That means if a Soviet withdraw is uh, intermediate range missile from Eastern Germany and the Eastern European countries, the NATO will not deploy its uh, Pursing 2 missiles and uh, ground-based uh, cruise missiles. And yeah, the, eventually the Soviet Union deployed its missiles in East Germany and uh, East European countries. So for as countermeasures, NATO also deployed uh, ground-based cruise missiles and the Pershing 2 missiles in Ger West Germany, Netherlands, Italy, and uh, Sicily, and Corsica, as well as Britain. So it was kind of a confrontation between the Soviet Union and the NATO forces. And after Gorbachev assumed the post general secretary of the Soviet, Soviet Union, the US and Soviet began some kind of negotiation over their intermediate range nucle nuclear missiles. And uh, December 1987, the Gorbachev and the Reagan signed on the INF Treaty, which means both parties will uh, eliminate its uh, intermediate range missiles and some short range missiles. The ranges between uh, 500 to 10, uh, 10, 500 to 1,000 kilometers. So by 1991. 2,692 missiles were eliminated and the pact, the treaty, uh, maintained up to two weeks ago. In 2014, the U.S. Uh, intel community warned that uh, Russia was uh, developing kind of uh, intermediate range missile again, which is uh, SSC-8. And Russia claimed that this is kind of a countermeasure against your uh, UAVs. So we are fine. This is the SSC-8. So uh, US defense community began to be worried about some, some military imbalance between the Soviet, the Russia, and the United States. And there is another concern, that is China. China has a major three types of missiles. One is a Dungpeng 16, Dungpeng 21, and Dungpeng 26. Especially Dungpeng 21 has, is very accurate, around 30 meters of CEP, circular error probability. And Dungpeng 26 has around 3,000 3, to 4,000 kilometers of range, and those two missiles threaten some uh, U.S. force projection capability in East Asian, in the East Asian Sea. So these two missiles are kind of core capability for China's aid to aid capability. That is the anti-assess area denial strategy. So U.S. response, first response was uh, to withdraw from INF Treaty. So just two weeks ago, U.S. announced that it will withdraw from the INF treaty with Russia in six months, unless Moscow ends its alleged violations 
The second response was a 2018 NPR. Uh, the NPR nuclear posture review says that Russia is developing all sort of missiles and the delivery systems such as uh, low yield missiles, nuclear missiles, and uh, nuclear torpedoes. So we needed to develop uh, low yield SLBM, SLCM, and ALCM, as well as uh, ground missiles. So there are some pros and cons. Proponents say, say, said that Russia already violated the INF Treaty, so the United States and the NATO have, have some authority and they have some right to counterbalance Russia's uh, violation. And we need this, we need a individual because we need to counterbalance the China. And we need this kind of expanded part participation required because India, Pakistan, Iran, and North Korea are developing their own missile systems. And the withdrawal from the INF Treaty will give us some kind of a strategic flexibility. But there are very strong opponents. They say that uh, Russia will be unleashed. So Russia will develop and Russia will uh, uh, accelerate its movement. So a week ago, the Putin said, said that we will develop new missile systems, which is short range, intermediate range, and long range, and we will develop our own maneuverable re-entry vehicles. So Russia is kind of uh, speeding up. So therefore, new arms race and uh, proliferation We'll, we'll see some new arms race and proliferation, and therefore there will be some strategic instability. And accommodating other countries such as North Korea, China are impossible. So we must retain, or at least we need to modify INF rather than withdraw from the INF. So this is the background of INF treaty and the background of our project. So you have two missions. One group will answer the first question. So that is the implications of, implications of INF treaty withdrawal. And the second group will answer the question, how can we retain or revise the treaty? So uh, Two groups will work on this question, and one group one group will work on this question, and the other group will work on this question. So, if you want to change your group, please tell us, and unless we will reshuffle you, because uh, you may need uh, some around uh, five people for each group, and Eric and I will gather your papers and combine them into one piece of report. So this is kind of a good project. Yeah. Make sense? Who's the target audience? Like we said it's like top people in like DC, like State Department president, but kind of referring back to one of the previous questions is, are we actually writing a policy statement or are we just writing like a normal report, I guess? Just, just You're writing an analysis of the INF with policy recommendations as to what to do about the current situation that would be of interest to anyone who's interested in the INF treaty. We have uh, circulated previous uh, papers of this class to other members of the NSSC, the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. We've sometimes distributed them to people in government and to other scholars interested in the field. Like Sorry, say again. Should be written with like an eye towards like this is Trump and Putin specific. It's not so much Trump and Putin specific. It's looking at the issues and determining ways in which either treaty can be modified or reassembled. So consult basically. Consult. 
So each paper may be uh, 20 pages, 25 pages. So each person will write around five pages. This is not so burdensome, burdensome isn't it? What if we have available a previous paper project to give to them? Yes. Then that would be good to have. Yeah. I've had some excellent project papers over the years. Okay. Yeah. Did you say anything about the business of the grading and the uh, 